Welcome to The Table Podcast, where we discuss issues of God and culture. Brought to you by Dallas Theological Seminary. Welcome to The Table, where we discuss issues of God and culture. I'm Casey Olander. I'm the web content specialist here at the Hendrick Center at DTS. And today we're talking about the topic of friendship. So I'm joined by two excellent guests. Uh, The first one is Drew Hunter. He's the teaching pastor at Zionsville Fellowship in Indiana, and he wrote a book. It's called Made for Friendship, the relationship that halves our sorrows and doubles our joys. So Drew, thanks for being with us today. Thanks for having me and excited to talk about this together. Yeah, I'm looking forward to it. And I'm also grateful that we're joined by Rebecca Scott. Rebecca is the online course coordinator for the online education department here at DTS, and she's also a PhD student working towards a dissertation on the subject of friendship. Thanks for being here. Thanks for having me. I'm I'm excited about this. Yeah, yeah, I think it'll be a lot of fun. Um, Friendship is one of those interesting things that I think a lot of us take for granted. Um, A lot of us would say that we have friends, but we don't think much about it. We don't think very deeply about what does it actually mean to have a friend or to be a friend. Everyone kind of has their own concept of friendship. Even children have a concept of friendship. They kind of know what friends are and um, have some sort of idea about what that's supposed to look like. But we don't always stop to think deeply about it. So I think I want to open up talking to each of you about how did you guys really begin reflecting on this idea of friendship? Why is it something that we should even take the time to consider? So we'll start with you. How about you, Drew? Sure. Yeah. There's a a few things that come to mind. So one of them is I think back to when this topic as a a focus of study became important to me. It was about um, 11 or maybe 12 years ago now. And I've had good friends in different seasons of my life and moved around a little bit growing up. So I had to kind of reset and then maintain friendships like that. But I've was just really grateful for close friends. But then about 12 years ago, I was studying the book of Proverbs to teach it. And I just sat down and read through the book and I was collecting the themes because I wanted to have messages on the themes that were most important in the book of Proverbs rather than me just bringing topics to it to look for. And I, I was not expecting friendship to be one of the most important themes of the book. Uh, money, would be obvious, of course, wisdom and and things like this, and maybe relationships in general. But I was struck by how many very specific and pointed things were said about friendship in that book. And so then that week that I spent studying that theme more deeply in friendship in Proverbs led me to also think about John 15 and Jesus calling his disciples and us his friends. And I just realized at some point that week that though I have I don't think I've taken friends for granted per se, but I had ne- I've never really stopped to think about what is friendship, why is it important, what, how much do I really value this, and then to think of Jesus as a friend. I have, of course, who knows how many times I had read that in the Gospel of John, um, but I was realized I was not really relating to him explicitly, intentionally, consciously in terms of friendship. So that week really changed my life Um, because ever since there, the topic, I just haven't been able to let go of it because it's just been such an increased joy to think about the value of friendship and then value my friends more and um, be more intentional about friendships and recognize the rich blessings that are in life because of it and talk to other people about this too. And then, of course, relating with Jesus on terms of friendship um, has been uh, a life changer for me too. So I'm just that that was the the week that it became really important to me to be intentional about thinking about friendship. That's awesome. I love that it was like a surprise to you. Like you went to mm-hmm. scripture not expecting to find that, but then you were like, wait a minute, this is something that I actually right. need to really reflect on. Yeah. Yeah, that's awesome. What about you, Rebecca? How did you start getting into this? Yeah, that's so cool, Drew. Um, I, I like how your your discovery of friendship sort of came out of a, a study of the Bible, out of Proverbs right. and everything else it had to say. Um, I think I kind of came at it from the the other angle of, um, of lived experience more. So as a child, friendship was very important to me. My friends were important to me. And that's that's acceptable in the context of childhood, right? But as I, as I grew and I went to college and I became an adult, uh, I, I started to, to grow very slowly in this awareness that that was, that was a little odd. And so I sensed, I intuited that friendship was something very important, very necessary, something that deserved to be invested in, but I didn't have the, the vocabulary to talk about it, and neither did the people around me, it, it seemed. Um, you know, they, there, there was no, 
there's a no ability to speak meaningfully about friendship. And so I just, uh, I, I became frustrated. I, I wanted a, a deeper context for understanding what, what this thing called friendship is. And I knew I needed to, I knew I needed to investigate it um, theologically and biblically. And I, I needed to just learn and develop a way to, to speak of it. And so that, that's sort of what started me investigating it more, more explicitly uh, when I came here to, to DTS, actually. So I ended up uh, writing my, my master's thesis on friendship, and uh, I, I finished that, and I just kind of felt like I, I wasn't done. There was more to say, and it's, it's one of those topics that uh, the, the deeper you dig, the richer you realize it is. And so it's, it's not just like a, a quick little investigation, a quick little study. Like, this is something I honestly think it's going to take me the, the rest of my life to get to the bottom of. And the, the implications of it are just so broad, theologically, but also practically. So it's, it's very, very worth investigating. And I'm, I'm really pleased and grateful that it came onto my radar. Yeah. So you don't think we're going to totally plumb the depths in this like 45 minute episode? I mean, stranger things have happened. <laughs> okay, but we'll try. I, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, so now that we've used this word several times, uh, what is friendship? Can we define it? Does it have certain hallmarks? What do y'all think? Yeah, what do you think? Me? Um, yeah. Oh my goodness! It was really funny. I was I was thinking about this question the other day, and uh, I, I was remembering. Uh, remember Plato's dialogue on friendship? I think it's Lysis, maybe it's called. And uh, he goes on and on investigating what friendship is, what it isn't. You know, just really just at length and he gets to the very end and the last sentence is and i wrote it down here even the last sentence the last half of the last sentence is but what a friend is we have not yet been able to find out <laughs> and so wow. if plato couldn't define friendship i i really don't think i stand the ghost of a chance <laughs> but <laughs> actually it's it's uh, historically been very difficult to define friendship mm -hmm. everybody's agreed philosophers theologians it's tough but um there was this guy named Cicero, this Roman statesman, and he took a stab at it, and he called it, uh, friendship is a complete accord on all subjects, human and divine, joined with mutual goodwill and affection. And so that was sort of a, a standard for a long time. And then in the Middle Ages, um, this Cistercian abbot came along, Aelred of Ravaux. You've probably read a lot of his yep. stuff. Yeah. And he sort of Great accepted... Uh, we all? Yeah, yeah, I know. He's <laughs> yeah, so yeah. popular. Good old Aelred. You know. It's basically, you know, Stephen King, but... <laughs> <laughs> but uh, anyway, uh, Elred accepted Cicero's definition, but then he sort of Christianized it, and he said, you know, friendship begins in Christ, continues in Christ, and is completed in Christ. So, you know, we can start there. I think it's really difficult to define friendship conclusively. I think at bare minimum, we have to say that it includes a, a common outlook on the most important things. Mm. Uh, it includes a concern for the other's well-being, and it uh, includes a, a mutual commitment to one another, all in the context of sort of a, a mutual affection. So, I don't know, but maybe Drew's got the, the final, the ultimate, the conclusive definition. <laughs> I, I don't, actually, but... Um, <laughs> Yeah, I think um, it, the shortest definition, if I was just kind of asked, you know, just by anyone on any, any day life, what friendship was, I would say it's a close relationship of truth and trust. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and it, my kind of expanded version of that would be it's an affectionate bond forged as we journey together with truth and trust. Mm -hmm. So, the idea is that there's a closeness, there's a bond that's forged, and it's mysteriously forged. Sometimes it's instant, sometimes it takes time, sometimes it's expected, sometimes it's not. But there's an affectionate bond. So it's not just uh, um, not just being bound together kind of abstractly, but there's a real love and affection that friends have for one another. So David and Jonathan's an example of that. So it's an affection. And then it's Forge as we journey together through life. So there's shared experience. It it deepens over time. We're we're journeying together toward the horizon of our future. Um, and then there's several additional ingredients in addition to affection and love, which would be truth and trust. And those are just essential. Speaking honestly um, and transparently about who you really are. The mask is gone. They know the real you. And there's trust. Trust is the foundation of friendship. If you remove trust. Um, it's like the foundation of a home cracks. That that home will eventually start coming down. You can't you can't feel safe there. Um, so that, that's kind of my working everyday definition of that. Um, and I think that that works for me because it 
it brings together some of the most essential ingredients um, of what friendship really is. And it's it's doable too. So I've come across definitions and then someone will give a definition and then uh, you, maybe you've read these things through history where someone's writing um, a few hundred years ago or a thousand years ago and then they'll say, I think there's maybe been three friendships in the whole world. You know, it's like, okay, uh, there's probably been a few more than that. So let's have a definition that can can include most of us, you know. <laughs> yeah, that's yeah. Morals. yeah. <laughs> that's funny. I feel like each of you highlighted some interesting things. There's a, a mutuality there um, that it's, you know, not just one sided. It's not like I can decide to be someone's friend who doesn't reciprocate. There also is a level of um, like genuineness, uh, the truth and trust, the like going together that you guys have highlighted and and sort of an opting in, you know, like it's not, oh, I was just born into this friendship. You know, like friendship is something that is occurs along the way and there's like a genuine um love for one and one another yeah. which is really interesting so drew you brought up david and jonathan um i wonder not just in scripture because hopefully we'll get to that but i wonder mm-hmm. um how has friendship kind of been seen throughout history is that the same as it's kind of seen nowadays in like contemporary culture or is there kind of been like a shift over time um rebecca how about we start with you Oh, I mean, I think there's definitely been a shift. Um, Drew, you should definitely weigh in here too. But um, yeah, like, you know, the ancient philosophers, Plato, Aristotle, uh, they thought it was the highest form of human love that could exist between individuals. They thought it was the foundation of the state. Um, And then you move into the medieval period and we see a a lot, well, before that even, uh, the church fathers, they talked extensively about friendship, Um, you know, and later later on, John Chrysostom, he said, friendship, the work of friendship was more important than raising the dead. And I don't know how you could, you know, uh, speak more highly of friendship than that. So, um, yeah, in, in ancient uh, philosophy, in the church fathers, and then in the medieval period, we also see a lot of the language of friendship, especially in the context of monasticism. This is where Aylred of Riveau wrote his book, Spiritual Friendship, which is sort of, you know, the book on on Christian friendship. Um, We also see it used theologically in Aquinas and stuff. And then when we we, uh, move into the Protestant Reformation and into modernism, um, we sort of see a a diminishment in in how often and how highly friendship is is spoken of. So, um, and I I think we're we're still existing in that space today where we've sort of lost a a heritage of friendship that um, our our forefathers and our foremothers uh, once enjoyed. So, Mm -hmm. yeah, I guess that's where we're sort of today, unfortunately. Yeah, that we don't value it nearly as highly. Like, I don't know anybody mm-hmm. who would say that it's the highest form of human relationship. Yeah, that that just doesn't even make sense to us anymore. Yeah, we don't even have a concept for it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I think um, even the past few hundred years, there's been a significant shift. So, you know, even in the, the era of the six, 15, 16, 1700s, um, it's not as commonly talked about in those uh, exalted ways in the past, but there are bright spots throughout and people valuing it. So Jonathan Edwards um, had some strong statements on friendship, not often, but when he did speak of it, um, he would he would use very lofty language. Of course, C.S. Lewis uh, is known um, for um, his writings and some of the writings that he had was directly on friendship. A, a well-known book of his is called The Four Loves and he deals with friendship in there. Um, John Newton, author of Amazing Girl, Grace, that hymn we sing, uh, he uh, wrote about friendship a little bit. He made a few important statements in, in just various things he wrote, and then he modeled it really well um, with William Cooper. And so it's a beautiful friendship to look into if he and another member of his church that then moved away, and they just be, they were the closest of friends throughout those years. And it wasn't viewed mainly as like pastor parishioner. It, their, their friendship was mainly viewed as a friendship. Um, so it's really beautiful. Um, but then even just this past... Um, you know, decades, there's been a massive decline, not only in thinking about friendship and valuing and friendship, but experiencing and practicing friendship. So um, then there's plenty of studies that have been picking up to show this has become a really hot trend in sociology. Um, so one study showed, I think it was Cigna Health Insurance showed that something like 54%, and, and this is now even, this study is a number of years old now, within the last decade, I think, still, but still not as recent as some of the newer ones, they were still saying that over half of the people that they surveyed said that their relationships weren't meaningful. 
Mm. Um, and 40% said no one really knew them at all, which is language of friendship, right? Is they basically are saying 40% of people said, I don't have a friend. And then if they studied this over the course of a few decades, and it was a sharp decline, and it's only gotten worse the past five or 10 years. So we're, we're in actually a really unique situation um, where where there's a decline in friendship. I think that's why I'm sensing even the past five years, there's been an increased awareness of like, we've got to talk about this. It's because we're, we're hitting a bottom here that's been going on for a long time, but it's kind of accelerated downward right now. Yeah. So yeah, we've lost our heritage and we've lost this amazing gift and it's um, it's there to recover. Yeah, that's true. It hasn't <laughs> expired. There's, <laughs> mm -hmm. It's not like it's lost forever. No. Yeah, did you have something to add? I don't know. I think Drew put it absolutely beautifully. Um, yeah, I think one of, you know, if I, it, every generation seems to have their own tasks and responsibilities and opportunities. And if I had to identify one of those for our generation, I really do think it is the, the explicit recovery of friendship. We need to learn to see it again, to talk about it again, talk about it again, to, uh, to cultivate it in our, our lives together again. Um, I think that's a, a huge opportunity and responsibility that we have. Which is really interesting because it's not as though the term is lost. People mm. still talk about friends, but a lot of times people mean those as like social media relationships. Mm. And it could mean somebody that I clicked a button, but I've never actually met ever or interacted with whatsoever. Um, yeah, it means everything and therefore it means nothing. Right, exactly. Yeah, yeah, people are like, oh, my friend. And they mean really somebody I don't even talk to. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right. Um, yeah, and then when they when they look for language to describe the closest relationships, it's interesting how people quickly move away from friendship language today. Yeah. So they'll say, oh, these are they're more than friends. Yeah. Or like, oh, you're not a friend. You're like family. And it's like, well, that's fine. I mean, family, that's a great metaphor too, pervasive in the Bible. Um, but it just strikes me that it's so interesting that people are so quick to jump away from friendship language when they want to grab language to express the closest of relationships. Mm -hmm. um, whereas, whereas friendship, uh, understood rightly, actually is exact, exactly the right word to use, in addition to, for, to family kinds of language, but friendship for sure. Yeah, we almost have it. It's almost pejorative, like, oh, we're just friends. Exactly. Like, friendship is right. like, oh, that's saying so yeah. much. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. like they're demoted almost yeah. from these like right. other other things. Mm -hmm. And that's so interesting how the language we use is, well, maybe it is informed by, or maybe it shapes the way that we think of friendship. It could, I guess, go both directions. Probably both, yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, could y'all speak to how do you think that things like social media and technology, like what impact has that had, especially because that's one of the new things Drew, you're talking about, like just in the last few years, that's yeah. one of the things that has become so pervasive. Um, Drew, how would you say that that has affected uh, our view of friendship? Yeah, I I'll note a few things. I think we're, we're going to be finding out over these coming years, just how much it's affected relationships, but a few things come to mind. So one is technology itself and social media has at a very basic level become a pretty big distraction in life. Mm -hmm. So in a culture where we already value this, you know, busyness too much, you know, it's like everyone's busy and we think everyone's busy, so we don't want to bother them with friendship. Uh, we think no one has time for it. On the other hand, we're spending inordinate amounts of time watching Netflix and on social media. I mean, the average time that people engage with Facebook um, is incredible on a daily basis. And so we're really, we, we're busy, but we're, we're doing these uh, low reward activities um, rather than actually experiencing friendship. So it's, it's become a distraction in life and just filling our time that we could use for friendship with these other digital distractions. Another issue- other people's friendships play out like <laughs> on the streaming yeah. services and on social media instead of actively participating in them. Yeah. Yeah. And so it's a distraction, but then you think, well, we're distracted by social media, but that's engaging with people, right? And engaging with Facebook friends. But um, it's it's a shallower, more superficial experience um, of friendship. So we're created as embodied creatures made for real experiences, life on life, face to face friendship, um, having experiences together and merely looking at a screen at people's general posts to the world um, is not anywhere close to the kind of connection we could have. So I, I remember um, John, the Apostle John wrote in Second John. He said, I'd rather not write with paper and ink. Mm -hmm. So he's using modern technology of his time. And I'm glad he did because we have his writings, right? Um, so he uses it, but he said, I'd rather not because 
As he said, I want to come speak face to face so that our joy may be complete. So there's a there's a ceiling on our joy that we're hitting if we are only using kind of this technology to connect, uh, where face to face is where the fullness of friendship uh, can be experienced. So that's another way that has affected us. And then uh, maybe a third one would be uh, the way that we use the internet and social media and to communicate. It rewards um, and seems to attract really unhealthy ways of relating to each other as humans. Um, I remember even when email came out, my dad, um, he was a, uh, a manager and he worked in a corporate world and he said pretty quickly, he's like, people will say things in email that they would never say to your face. Mm -hmm. So it becomes impersonal and um, we've seen this polarization politically and socially with tribalism and, and, and then that creates this sense like you can't trust people. You think everyone on the other side's crazy and then you look at you know, your neighbors in your neighborhood and you, you figure they hold views that they don't really view. And then you just are only wanting to talk to the people that are exactly aligned with you in every way. Um, and maybe those people are only found online. So those are a few ways that it's affected us. There's no doubt more, but that, that those are direct connections to affecting the way we relate to each other. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I like that you pointed out that, I mean, we're still going to see the ramifications for years to come. These are things that we're yeah. already seeing, but also that will continue the more prevalent yeah. it is. Yeah. Do you yeah. have anything to add, Rebecca? Oh, no, absolutely. I, I completely agree with all that. I think, um, yeah, I think things like Facebook and full disclosure, I haven't deleted my Facebook specifically because I do want to retain some sort of connection with, with friends that I've made over the years. But um, I have it too. Yeah, I'm not... No yeah, 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 exactly, <laughs> yeah. exactly. It actually, it actually but, has a unique role to strengthen friendship used properly. Yeah. Yes, exactly, exactly. Yeah. But yeah, I think inherent in in these platforms is a temptation to think that we can sort of transcend our finitude, you know, and connect with everyone. Mm -hmm. And when in reality, it's just not possible, as you say. Very and cool. so, um, you know, if it's if social media is distracting you from those embodied relationships that are possible, um, which are obviously going to be a few, then you know, I think getting as far away from it as is possible in this world is is definitely a great idea. Um, yeah. Yeah. Ditto on everything you said. Yeah. And if we do elevate friendship to the definitions that you guys were describing mm -hmm. earlier, where there's um, like a real sense of mutual affection and not mm -hmm. just we shook hands one time, then mm -hmm. um, like maybe we yeah, we would realize that we can't literally have a thousand friends. Yeah, yeah. I really think we we ought to choose alternate terminology for speaking of people we're connected with on Facebook. I mean, I have a, free, a few real life friends on there, but yeah. then I have most of the people, they're acquaintances and I value them and that is important and then I'm not trying to diminish mm -hmm. them by taking away the language <laughs> of friendship and reserving right. it for something more special. So um, yeah. definitely not trying to do that, but I do think we need to reserve the term friend for, for yeah. people with whom we do have that mutual affection, that trust, as you mentioned, um, those yeah. really meaningful connections in the real world. Yeah. Yeah, it seems like one one of the ways we can recover friendship is by also rec recovering a value of acquaintanceship and exactly. letting it be its own thing mm -hmm. and not a bad thing, right? Yeah, yeah. It's okay to be just friendly with some people and not friends. Right. Yeah. yeah. And not being offended. Wow, that person only thinks of me as an acquaintance. Well, let's yeah. be real. Like, that's what it is. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's not a bad thing. And if we were to become better friends, that would be a good thing. You know, mm -hmm. it's, there's many yeah. possibilities involved in being an acquaintance. Yeah. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Um, so I wonder, um, since you guys have thought so much about this and we've talked about like what it means to be human, we're embodied creatures, um, like what what bearing does friendship also have? If we have a robust like theology of it, what bearing does friendship have on the way that we understand God? Hmm. Drew? Yeah, um, it's been really helpful for me to think about friendship in connection with God and just the way he's made us. So a couple... Uh, things come to mind. One would be on the first page of the Bible, we see God create a world for friendship. So he creates the world and the way it's ordered in Genesis 1 and 2 is over the course of this creation week. He's creating realms, um, the, the sky, the sea, the land, and then he fills each realm with communal life. And then when he gets to humanity, the purpose is to fill the world with communal human life. But he starts with two, Adam and Eve, and he makes humanity in his own image and then encourage and calls them then to multiply and fill the world with society. Um, so we just see on page one, we see a God who is happy to 
bless the world uh, with friendship. And then even in chapter one, we get a clue as to why. And it tells us something about God because he says, let us make man in our image. And then he makes humanity in the plural, Adam and Eve in Genesis 1. And I know that some people debate, what what is the us going on? What does that refer to? I'm convinced that is a way of God referring to his plurality that we find out as we keep reading scripture. He's a triune God, Father, Son, and Spirit. And so this triune God is um, a unity in plurality, and he's an eternal communion of effusive love. And so this means that God did not create us or the world because he needed friends. He didn't create us because he had any lack in himself. He created the world to sh- uh, share his blessing. So the Puritan Richard Sibbs uh, refers to God as having a spreading goodness. And so I love that. It's like a picture of Genesis 1. God has this fullness of communal life and love, and he overflows to spread it in a creational world where he He then makes us in his image for friendship. So here we have a God who's enjoying communal love, friendship in a sense, and then he makes the world. And so that tells us one really important thing about God, and that makes him unique from any other worldview or religion or concept of God out there. He's not just this singular God in isolation and lonely and therefore has needs and he needs us. Um, He's one in three. And so it it means the Trinity is not so much kind of uh, just like a math problem to be solved. Um, It's a wonder to enjoy um, and that he would he would invite us to share in his communion. And that, that's really the purpose of the universe. He creates us. And, and just fast forward to the very end of the Bible, and we have a new creation of embodied joy in friendship with the Lord Jesus and all those who are united to him. So from beginning to end, the book ends of the Bible show this God of love creating a world of friendship. Um, and what a privilege to be a part of this. Yeah. That's wonderful. Yeah. Well, anything to add? That is that is so cool. I one of my favorite things about your book is uh, just how you do lay out a biblical theology of of friendship. And um, yeah, I I think part of the problem with friendship when you speak of it with regard to the Bible and theology is that it's everywhere and it's so yeah. easy to miss the forest for the trees and mm-hmm. part of my struggle over the years has been trying to find ways to to point it out and to articulate it in, yeah. in ways that help other people to see it because it's because it's everywhere and so it's like saying hey look at the air we're breathing you know and so um yeah it's i think we just have to keep pointing out these these cosmic themes over and over again until until they're they're visible to our eyes. Um, I was thinking about what um, this theologian John Webster, he said that um, uh, the doctrine of the Trinity and the doctrine of creation, they're distributed doctrines, and they ki- which means they kind of they kind of inform and are informed by all of the other theological topics. So salvation, um, humanity, mm-hmm. eschatology, um, they're all tied into wow. who God is yeah. and what it means to, to live I- in his creation. And I think, um, although I would not elevate friendship to the level of the doctrine of the Trinity or of the doctrine of creation, <laughs> right. I think friendship functions in a similar fashion. Um, it, mm-hmm. it informs everything we understand about who God is and what he's yeah. doing and who we are. And it's it's just absolutely essential that we see that and allow it to shape our lives accordingly. Yeah, it's, it, I, I really love the way you uh, put that because in one sense, I think a lot of people would say friendship is nowhere. It's not in any of those doctrines and it's <laughs> really nowhere in the Bible, maybe a few places. But what you're saying is once you once you kind of see what friendship really is and notice where it's explicit Mm -hmm. and then see that it's very tightly tied other places and it's implied it's everywhere so you could just walk through the doctrine of creation as you know i was just sharing a moment ago and Mm -hmm. the fall i mean what's the first result of the fall it's hiding it's relational breakdown Mm -hmm. Um, and then redemption what is redemption it's god inviting us back into friendship with one another and himself i mean jesus came Mm -hmm. as the friend of sinners calling his disciples his friends and the the night before he goes to the cross to die he wants his disciples to understand what's about to happen and he explains it in terms of friendship he says greater love has no one than this that someone lay down his life for his friends. And so right there, actually, I think since writing the book, I've done a lot more thinking just mm-hmm. over over time about John uh, 13 to 15 and what's going on there with love. 
And just I'm kind of thinking of it even more in light of what you said, because you have the doctrine of the church right there, because he says, a new command I give you, the new covenant command is to love one another. And then he defines that he kind of ratchets it up saying, as I've loved you, you're to love one another. And then he defines it in terms of friendship, because he goes right on to say, greater love has no one than this, that a man laid down his life for his friends. So what's the church? We're called to love one another Mm -hmm. as Christ loved us in terms of friendship. Mm -hmm. And that's according to Jesus's own teaching. Um, What is the cross? It's a cosmic act of friendship where he gives his life down for his friends. Again, Jesus himself defining the cross itself and the atonement in terms of friendship. And of course, eschatology, the world of friendship to come. So we could probably keep going, but you're kind of just firing my mind with like thinking (laughs) through all these topics and showing how like really it is integrated in everywhere. I absolutely love it. I really do. It's, I mean, there are just layers to this, and you go back over the story again and again, and it just goes deeper and deeper. I mean, uh, it, it occurred to me in the shower the other day, I was thinking about Genesis 1-1, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And just in that one verse, we have the seeds of understanding that God is a friendly God. He's created us, mm. And he's disclosed himself to us. Mm -hmm. And so, Mm -hmm. uh, of course, your case for him being a friendly God is going to be strengthened if you go on and see the whole narrative played out as you've you've walked it out for us. But just right there, we have the makings of understanding that God is a friend. Um, And so that's that's just tremendous. Uh, And then you you go all the way through the, the glorious story of redemption and everything, and you come to the church. And I was thinking about something uh, that Eastern Orthodox theologian Pavel Florinsky said, and he, he talked about how at their, at their pinnacle, um, uh, siblinghood and friendship merge, they join. And I think that's what we see happening in the church as well. There's so much sibling language, and as you said, we're the community of God's friends. Um, yeah. And that is all, it's all wrapped up in, in each other and in one another. It's, it's, right. it's one thing that God is doing, um, and wow. it's, yeah. it's just so cool. <laughs> Yeah, yep. it's Agreed. like foundational mm-hmm. for understanding scripture. And so you don't like see David and Jonathan as like, oh, that's kind of quirky. They talk about this friendship a lot. Like, <laughs> that's just one spot. Mm-hmm. No, it's like something that is woven throughout the oh, entire yeah. narrative of scripture. Mm-hmm. And it helps us understand how we relate to God. And so the fact that Jesus calls us friends, if we do elevate the idea of friendship, mm-hmm. is so much more meaningful and like beautiful. I'm really struck by that, that Jesus would want to be friends with me. Like, mm-hmm. instead of just thinking that as a cla- casual click of a button, mm-hmm. oh, that's, right. that's something that's so meaningful and, and rich, and I'm honored and mm-hmm. humbled, and um, yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah, I'm really struck by that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I think um, it takes it takes getting a, a growing understanding of the value and richness and thickness of friendship mm-hmm for the idea of the notion of Jesus being a friend to actually do land in a weighty way, mm-hmm, right? Yeah. Because if we just take our current cultural understanding of friendship, which is pretty, you know, chum, buddy, pal, you know, good if you have extra time in life, it's an optional thing. Oh, I remember that was nice, you know, in college or something. And then you say, you know, Jesus is also your friend. It's like, okay, cool, I guess. Like, mm-hmm. moving on, right? But if you, if once we realize just how rich friendship really is, then for Jesus to define his cross as an act of friendship and to befriend us in love uh, is a wonder. And and we should we should regularly be thinking of in terms not just as a savior and Lord, but also as a dear friend. And that and he authorizes this. It's his idea. Yeah, and that's something so. we can marvel at instead of being like, oh, hmm. Like, that's interesting that he would use that term. It becomes so much more wondrous if we mm-hmm. take it that seriously. Um, yeah. I think it's uh, it's interesting. It's C.S. Lewis, I think, in The Four Loves, who talks about, he says it a lot better than I'm about to say it, but he uh, says something along the lines of, um, it should be more noteworthy that we don't have these demonstrative expressions of friendship um, that are like regular in our society today, rather than the fact that some people like David and Jonathan had it long yeah. ago. Um, that we're the ones who are weird, not them, when we read these <laughs> yes. different expressions of friendship. Yeah. Yeah, that makes me think, too, of um, just what's happened. I mean, this is obviously another another related topic that's that's uh, pretty wide-reaching in itself, but just the sexualization of relationships. Mm-hmm. And so, David and Jonathan, there's, you know, tons of different articles 
articles and people writing saying that maybe there's more going on than just a friendship there, right? And that's just a completely modern interpretation. It was unheard of before a few decades ago. And that tells us more about where we are right now in our understanding of sexuality and friendship than it does actually about David and Jonathan. Um, and there's a, a book I read called uh, The Overflowing of Friendship by a historian named Richard Godbeer. Um, not not a believer as far as I know, but he's just he's just analyzing friendships in the founding era of America between men as you look at their letters to each other. Mm-hmm. And and he's he found it to be filled with affectionate language for one another. And uh, he says he reads what these guys wrote to each other to his classes today in college and jaws drop. And they're like, no way that's just friendship, right? There's more going on. He's like, no, but it's because we've just, we, especially for men in our culture, we've taken this affectionate aspect of it and we've just sexualized it and to say that that's either a feminine quality or it's for someone who's going to be in a sexualized relationship with another man, rather than recognizing that this is supposed to be a very normal, natural part of what it really means to be a man in friendship. Mm -hmm. Um, So even how we experience these things, and like David and Jonathan, it should be way more normal, but we're we're just, we're in a unique time. And it's really helpful just to get that historical perspective and realize like, we're off here, our default understanding of what friendship is and should look like, let's not assume that it's correct. Let's keep stepping back, Mm -hmm. and then try to adjust to a greater vision. Mm. Yeah, I think that's one of the tragedies of our day that we we use love, romance, and sex in sort of this synonymous way, and we're no longer able to parse out the distinctions between them. And I think that's one of the benefits of, of really recovering a, a robust concept of friendship, is that we we might be able to see the distinctions again. And, um, you know, we even say things like, God is love. And I don't even, I don't think we always necessarily know what that means anymore, just because of this, this habit we have of sexualizing everything. It, so to say yeah. God is love, it, it no longer makes sense because we don't remember what love is. And so I, I think friendship, if we recovered that idea and that practice, it could actually help us understand what love is again. And if we were to say, like Aylred did, God is friendship, that might actually be more accurate and closer to what, you know, the biblical mm-hmm. authors that are, you know, the ancient theologians were getting at than what we might mean today when we say God is love. Um, right. So, yeah. 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 So, how do we go about recapturing this this high esteem, this, like, deep value for friendship? You know, if, if our listeners are like, oh, okay, like, maybe friendship really is a big deal. Maybe I can't just throw to, throw the word around mm-hmm. so frivolously. Um, what are some things that, that y'all would encourage people to do um, as we, like, seek to... Um, yeah, to, to recapture the value of friendship. Well, I think Drew's written a lot about this in his book, so I'm really curious to hear what he has to say. Um, I think one of the first things that comes to mind for me is just be a good friend. Like, before I go out looking for other people and wishing they'd be good friends to me, I, I need to learn what it is to be a good friend to other people. And we, we exist in a world in which we're not quite sure how to do that anymore. And so somebody needs to be the first to say, hey, look, even if this is not reciprocated perfectly, I am still going to devote myself to learning how to be a good friend, regardless if that ever gets returned to me in this life. You know, we need to begin patterning what friendship looks like um, in order to set other people up and future generations for success. Um, So that's just one thing. There's another zillion out there. Um, Drew, you got any? Sure. Yeah. Um, This is actually something that uh, since writing the book, I've done a lot more thinking Mm -hmm. about as well, just as I've tried to grow as a friend and I've tried to just pay attention to people who do it well. Mm -hmm. Um, And so um, there's a few things things that kind of categories that come to mind. So one, I love that. Just be a good friend, because if you're if you're just um, trying to find someone that's a good friend Mm -hmm. and you're not actually trying to be a good friend, even if they're not like it's not going to work, you're putting so much pressure and expectations on people and you won't be the kind of friend that they'll want Mm -hmm. to be a friend of. Um, Another category is just even thinking about Jesus as the truest friend. I mean, he is the ideal human, the true servant. He's the truest friend. And so he models for us what true friendship looks like. And even at the cross, he's defining it as sacrificial love. Um, And so, and calling us to love one another in terms of friendship opens up really all the, all the 
areas in which the New Testament speaks of what love looks like together and the fruit of the Spirit. Mm-hmm. Like, they're not, it, friendship isn't always explicitly mentioned, but that's, that's how you are a good friend. So, um, love, joy, peace, patience, goodness, bearing one another's burdens, forgiving one another, all those one another's, mm-hmm. actually doing them um, and practicing them with other people builds friendship. And I remember um, Don Carson had this comment in a, a book he wrote on the Sermon on the Mount on the Beatitudes, and he said something like, we all love the Beatitudes, and it seems like people, because they love them so much, think that they're actually doing them. <laughs> it's like, I feel like it's a bit like that with friendship and these yeah. qualities. It's like, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Love one another, forgive one another, bear each other's burdens. It's like, yeah, but are you whose burdens are you actually bearing? Mm. And you can't do that by even as a church you're, by showing up to programs and events. Like th- this has to be a real everyday relationship. Mm-hmm. So that'd be another category. And then there's just a lot of specific strategies. And so I would just say, look for people that do this well and take notes. Mm-hmm. A few things that I've learned from watching and trying to implement it. One, um, Try to be a connector, or if you're not, look for connectors and honor them for being connectors. And by connector, I mean someone who's good at connecting people. Mm -hmm. So some of my friendships I've I've looked back on and realized that the reason why they're so strong um, is because one of the guys is always calling us together and getting ideas Mm -hmm. and and reminding us to get together and, and initiating that. So let's learn from that kind of person how we can be a connector and introduce people to each other and create environments for friendship um, and uh, and honor those people and say, do you know, you do such a good job with this. Thank you for strengthening my friendships by being that. Another thing would be getting some rhythms and habits in your life or just scheduling friendship. So if you think of all the essential things in life, um, the only way they become functional priorities in your life is if you schedule it. So being with a church family on Sunday morning, having a small group, eating with your family, if that's a priority or a friend, um, sleep, exercise, time communing with God and friendship through the word and prayer. All those things don't happen unless you schedule them and build rhythms. And so going to work. So friendship, think of it as, okay, when can I intentionally build friendship into my weekly and monthly rhythm of life? Is there an evening a week that I want to reserve to just get together with people, invite people over, have a meal with someone, connect some other people together, maybe around a fire? Um, is there a, a morning breakfast where you can think uh, on Wednesday mornings, um, I'm going to meet with this friend every other week, or I'm just going to have breakfast with somebody and I'll invite them to meet. I have some coworkers that might live near or work near me and we'll just meet for lunch maybe on a certain day a week. Um, so those are some ideas. Um Another one would be learning to just be a curious, kind question asker in conversation. Mm -hmm. Um, So, um, Rebecca, you kind of nodded on that. I'd love to hear what you have to say about questions. Why is that important to you, do you think? Because we talk so much and we talk all about (laughs) ourselves and we make assumptions about other people. And if if you're actually going to enter into somebody's life as a friend, you need to know them, not as you perceive them to be, but as they actually are. And hmm. the only way you achieve that is by listening. Um, yeah. Not as you perceive That's a great them way to put it. Because if... Mm-hmm. As they actually are. Well, yeah. Yeah. Because if that's going back to what we said earlier about the definition of friendship as part of it is being known and knowing each other and transparent um, and trusting each other and being transparent, then you you have to ask questions to learn about them. And it also just helps conversations go let more than superficial. Mm-hmm. So um, I'm a, I also think actually small talk's important for friendship. So yeah. I think if people stay in small talk mode all the time, that is really frustrating, you know? Like mm-hmm. if, <laughs> that's really frustrating, but to dismiss it altogether isn't good either because small talk itself is a way of showing someone that you're going to be easy to be around right now, right? Mm -hmm. You care about them. They have an easy, like, welcome mat into conversation with you. They can be, when you engage someone with small talk, you're making it easy for them to talk, you know, weather, sports, just something they can talk about it. They're set at ease. They're participating already. You're saying that you want to talk with them and and they're welcome here. And then from there, ask good questions to go deeper. Um, And so I have a few go-to questions that I always try to just have in mind to ask that work for me. Some can be awkward, but the ones I use are something like, how have you been lately? Right? That's not just what you do today. It's how have you been? Um, Or to think about how things are at work or family life or something like this or school, I'll ask, um, how are things at work? How are things with school right now? It's different than just 
asking for like, are things going well or um, giving information of just what's going on, but just how are things going? Or I'll, I think just the other day, um, I came across a new one on accident. I was just trying to think of a different question to ask someone. I think I'll use it more if I can remember it right now. It was something like, oh, um, what are you enjoying in life these days? <laughs> and so it just gets talking beyond the normal things into what's important to the person. And then once you ask some of those questions, just be, stay curious, ask follow-up questions, genuinely love them. And then, of course, make sure you don't only go into question asking mode because you can kind of react to the, well, I don't want to just talk the whole time mode. Mm -hmm. And then you ask questions the whole time and they talk, but they didn't get to know you then. So there is a reciprocating um, skill that's that's needed uh, to be learned here. Um, so I think those are those are key ways. Um, there's a lot more, but those those are good starters, I think. Yeah, those are really helpful. I think that both of you were highlighting that friendship takes a measure of intentionality mm -hmm. as opposed to just, yeah. oh, it might happen to me one day. No, yeah. it, like not it's right. not a passive thing mm -hmm. that might occur, but rather it's something that we need to be intentional about. And Drew, I think that was really helpful too. You don't have to go straight for, what's your deepest, darkest secret? Like <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> we can do small talk and we can ask some meaningful questions that help people to feel at ease and mm -hmm. feel comfortable. Um, yeah. And I think that hopefully we get more practice over time. And so we yeah. learn how to be better friends by trying to be better friends. And that's the practice of friendship. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. I yeah. think that it's, it's an art, not a science, but it's something still that we can excel at and get better at over time. Mm -hmm. yeah. 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 That's good. And, and part of it too, is just, it's so connected to just being an enjoyable human being with people, <laughs> you know, <laughs> yes. um, mm -hmm. like, you're not going to have good friends or friends that really want to be around you if you don't kill a tendency, if you have it, I used to, to just be sarcastic mm -hmm. or to be critical and grumbly. Um, so those, there's some basic things, too. I just think, you know, we just need we there's no harm in overcorrecting and just being a, an encourager of people. Mm -hmm. um, Ray, Ray Orland um, pastor says, you know, he's never seen anyone who's too encouraged or who will walk <laughs> in a room over encouraged. So uh, we're in a very critical um, time period right now where people are just critical all the time. And so just encouraging people and reaching out in small ways. I mean, even using technology to send a quick email or text message, or if they don't answer, leave a voicemail and include things that are very specific that you love about that person, yeah. respect about them and that you notice. And um, there was even a, an article that I read about, um, it was in the New York Times, about the importance of small touch points and reaching out in small ways. And the study was interesting because it said that the thesis of the study they did was people tend to underestimate how important it is to their friends to reach out in small ways, like just mm -hmm. send a note saying, hey, I'm thinking of you. Um, or, hey, I was just driving to work, figured I'd give you a call. Um, you're probably you know, tied up with something, but I just wanted you to know that I'm thinking about you. Um, I love you, and I hope you have a great day, you know, or something like that. Um, so the study is saying that basically on the giving end, we assume our friends won't care or they're too busy or it won't matter to them. So we don't do it. And if we do, we think, well, it's not a big deal. But on the receiving end, we love to receive those. It's so encouraging, so strengthening. So what we need to do then is learn the wisdom as the giver to just know and assume that our sense of the importance of this is not in tune with reality. And so let's go over the top with even these small touch points um, and then infuse that with encouraging and honoring each other and saying I love you to people and making that non-weird Mm -hmm. You know, yeah. so those kinds of things are really helpful, too. Yeah, that's fascinating. And I feel like that goes back to what we talked about earlier, that if we feel awkward about something or we're like, oh, that's a little too mushy for me, you know, like that might be uncomfortable. Well, throughout all of history, that's been so much more normative than we think mm -hmm. about it, like telling people that you love them or telling them something really specific about their character yeah. or about their personality that you just enjoy about them. If they're your friend, mm -hmm. then presumably there's something that you enjoy about them. Mm -hmm. So. I feel like there's so much more that we could talk about. But since our time is about up, um, just real quick, are there some resources that you guys would recommend to people if people want to learn more about friendship? Ooh. Obviously, I would recommend Drew's book, Made for Friendship. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, definitely that. My copy as well. Um, Ailred of Revaux, the, the old dead Cister Cistercian abbot. Uh, he wrote Spiritual Friendship, which is, everybody should read it. Bit dense, but it's excellent and um, definitely worth worthwhile. And then um, 
Uh, Victor Lee Austin wrote a book uh, called Friendship, the Heart of Being Human, published by Baker a few years ago. Um, and it's, it's really good, and everyone should read that one as well. Um, more accessible than Aylred of Ravo's Spiritual Friendship, for sure. <laughs> yeah. yeah, and I think um, not neglecting, just kind of looking for this theme in the Bible. So yes. study yeah. Proverbs and look for what it says about friendship. There's some amazing things in there. And having the, this lens... Th um, to read scripture with just being noticing where friendship is noted or the qualities of friends are noted and just integrating that into your thinking and, and application of the Bible. So as you read the Bible and it's a call to bear one another's burdens and forgive one another and love one another, you just be thinking about uh, how that's a resource to help you become a good friend and to pray for your friends. So I think the Bible itself can be perhaps an untapped resource for this for some people. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that would be um, a key um, as well. And then Coleman Ford just wrote a great book um, that's on spiritual formation. Okay, what's the name of the book, Rebecca? You're just not trying to think of it. I have it sitting okay. in my room. Um, is it oh, in, in his image or formed in his yeah, image? Yeah, something to do with image. This oh, is terrible. Okay. Um, it's a great book on integrating just a lot of important aspects to spiritual growth and growth as a Christian that are often neglected. And he talks about the Trinity in there and union with Christ. And he has a chapter on friendship and the importance of that in community for growing um, as a Christian as well. It's an excellent resource as well. So that's by Coleman Ford. So Have you seen his, uh, he just came out with a whole book on friendship and the letters of Augustine, I think, as well. Um, I think I saw that. Yeah, yeah that'll be interesting. Yeah. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's awesome. Mm -hmm. Well, this has been so helpful. Drew and Rebecca, I really appreciate you guys being our guests today. And um, I hope that you guys, the listeners, will be encouraged to be intentional with your friendships, to, to take friendship seriously and to elevate it as something that's significant, something that's given to us by God and something that we can see all throughout the pages of Scripture. And so I'm grateful that you guys could be our guests today. And we thank you guys, our listeners, and hope that you'll join us next time when we discuss issues of God and culture. Thanks for listening to The Table Podcast. Dallas Theological Seminary. Teach truth. Love well.